Hello, and welcome to Foolish Musings. In this episode, we'll be examining Han Fei, the Chinese thinker from the early classical period and the school of legalism from which he was a part. As per usual, I'd like to start with some disclaimers. Han Fei is a contentious philosopher in some ways. He talks about a school of philosophy which is to the modern Western liberal democratic mindset uh, seen as quite totalitarian and even as brutal. It's also important to know that during the Maoist period of China's modern history, the legalists, in particular uh, Shang Yang and Han Fei, were promoted as sort of this idealized concept of philosophy within China, while a lot of other Chinese philosophy, particularly Confucianism, uh, was degraded. And as such, legalism has been linked with some of the excesses of the Maoist regime, including widespread death, devastation, and the Cultural Revolution. However, this should not be the only reason why we think about the legalists, and I think that in this episode I'll examine his philosophy in a in a broader spectrum and see uh, from what different angles and what different perspectives we can take, and how it can fit into that broader conception of classical Chinese philosophy. So, as I've already discussed, Han Fei is a contentious figure. But it's really important that before we go through and actually examine Hunt Fei's philosophy, we understand who he is as a person. So who was Han Fei? Han Fei, or Han Feizhe as he's sometimes known, uh, was a Chinese philosopher in the Warring States period. So that's that early period of Chinese history prior to the unification of China under the Qin. Uh, and he came from the state of Han, where he was a prince. Uh, now, Han Fei himself uh, is traditionally thought as having studied under the Confucian scholar of Kunze. Now, Kunze is uh, one of these Confucian thinkers coming much later after the original man himself, Confucius, uh, and he will have his own lecture as well because he's quite important in that Confucian tradition. But his conception of human nature uh, was that uh, human nature is inherently evil and needs to be shaped by the ritual and by the ethics of the Confucian class, by the Shi. However, this actual tradition of him being the teacher of Han Fei may have been worked in later. Uh, something sort of to justify why Han Fei's thinking and moral slash political philosophy went down the line it did. However, uh, Han Fei was also said to have been a student under Kunse with Li Shi, uh, someone who became very important in the Qin state uh, as an advisor. Now, Han Fei uh, wrote numerous tractates uh, to his own uh, family, to the king of Han, uh, and unfortunately he was not very influential in his own time. Uh, however, his writings would become very influential on the early Qin dynasty, as in the dynasty which uh, ended up conquering and then uh, subordinating and unifying the entirety of China under their rule. Despite this, uh, when he was eventually captured by the Qin, uh, it is traditionally said that Li Shi actually used his influence with uh, the Qin king to ensure that he would be killed uh, because he was concerned about the influence they would have and the uh, level of influence that his writings was having upon the Qin, potentially uh, resulting in himself being uh, excluded from that sort of control over the, the imperial household. And for this reason... Uh, Han Fei himself ended up being executed. Now, it's interesting because Han Fei and one of the other writers in legalist thought who's quite important, Shang Yang, who we'll talk about a bit later, uh, ended up being killed uh, by state power. And this is interesting because they're often seen as the apologetics for state power. Uh, and so it could be as well that a lot of these traditions and uh, this a kind of story narrative that's built up around Han Fei is actually uh, later writers, particularly Confucians, who are very hostile to legalistic thought, uh, who are kind of justifying uh, the failure of their own thinking or the, the moral repugnancy of their own political thought. Now, Han Fei, uh, should be remembered, exists as the capstone of a tradition. Uh, he draws upon the works of his predecessors and then uh, creates a single, cohesive, holistic doctrine which draws upon the differing ideas that exist throughout their own tractates. Unfortunately, due to uh, 
some of the circumstances that legalism went through, particularly post the fall of the Qin dynasty, uh, not a huge amount of uh, legalistic tractates or doctrine comes down to us. Uh, we're primarily relying upon sh uh, the work by Han Fei himself, and then also a mostly complete work by Shan Yang, although uh, other uh, fragments of the works of other legalists do come down to us. Han Fei himself borrowed heavily upon uh, the different authors, such as Shang Yang, uh, drawing upon his emphasis of laws, as well as the requirement for a strong military and a strong state uh, to exist. Uh, he drew upon as well the ideas of Shen Dao, uh, which were ideas uh, talking about uh, authority and prophecy in terms of positional power or uh, circumstantial advantage, Shi. Uh, as well as law or the administrative uh, technique fa. Uh, he also draws upon the idea of Shen Bu Hai. Uh, Shen Bu Hai is quite important. Uh, his uh, ideas of administrative techniques and mannerisms uh, almost sort of become a bedrock upon which the later administrative and meritocracy style based uh, Chinese uh, bureaucracy would exist. And it's important to remember that uh, Han Fei doesn't come to us ex nihilo. However, uh, he certainly is probably the most dynamic and the most philosophically engaging writer of this tradition uh, from what we can understand uh, from the existing corpus. So now we turn to what is the core principle uh, in Han Fei's legalism. And I would argue that it, it sits in and around the term and the idea of centralized power. So, uh, for Han Fei, uh, the undermining of centralized power or the incorrect use of centralized power, uh, allowing that power to be divested from the central source, is realistically uh, the root of all evil when it comes to the collapse of a state. Uh, like all other early Chinese philosophers, uh, although they come at the problem from many different angles, using many different systems of ethics, they all kind of agree upon this idea uh, that the, the resolution to China's woes and that this period of upheaval uh, in the Warring States period has to be a centralized monarchy. And for Han Fei, he takes that to a logical conclusion, that logical end state, that rather than this feudalistic, aristocratic uh, Zhao regime, which had existed in the golden past, China needed to move to a centralized, powerful monarchy. Han Fei thus saw the ruler themselves as the most central aspect of the apparatus of state. They were that linchpin upon which the society and the state itself would survive, thrive, or collapse and decline. Uh, and because of this, uh, Han Fei really emphasizes the centrality of the role of that, that ruler to make sure that they themselves are always seen as the individual who is associated with the mechanisms of state power, whether that be through reward or punishment, and whether that be through uh, the use of administrative or military power. Han Fei also has a rather dim view of human nature. Uh, he sees that all humans are self-interested, acting in their own interests or in the interests of their immediate family, and as such, uh, they sort of need to... that needs to be taken into account uh, for the ruler. He needs to understand that all the people that he are working with are working for their own interest. In particular, uh, this it means that he needs to be aware that when individuals are asking for favours or for the ability to execute punishments, uh, by divesting his powers and his influence to these individuals, uh, they will uh, essentially usurp that power from his own own coffers uh, and then sort of uh, at his detriment uh, make benefit to themselves. Uh, Han Fei is uh, so adamant on this level and this sort of point that he, he doesn't even talk about the advisors but he's also talking about members of the, the ruler's family, uh, close members, uh, friends, courtesans, confidants who could potentially utilize their access to influence or gain control over the throne and use the power to their own ends. Because of this, Han Fei preaches the idea of the ruler as being like an empty vessel. Uh, there's actually some uh, 
sort of debate at the scholarly level as to whether there might be some Taoist influence over Han Fei in this dimension. He's sort of emulating this idea of the empty vessel, uh, the empty way. Uh, basically, uh, what Han Fei is suggesting is that the ruler themselves needs to be still unmoving and hide, mask their emotions uh, from their subordinates and their family members. Uh, if a subordinate or a family member notices that uh, the emperor or the king likes a certain thing, uh, then they will play to that particular uh, that desire to get their ends. If they note that he dislikes a certain thing, uh, then they will utilize that as a toehold to potentially undercut uh, one of their adversaries and for, uh, put forward their own agenda. And so, uh, Hun Fei actually quotes uh, the Yellow Theark, the idea that uh, the administrator and the king fight a thousand battles a day. It's about this constantly uh, ongoing psychological warfare between the emperor, who is attempting to conceal all of his intentions, acting as almost like a blank slate, uh, and then only reacting uh, to the actions of of his subordinates, his administrators, and his family, never allowing them to, to gain a positional advantage uh, through understanding his desires, his emotions, and his wants. Now, despite this focus on the centrality of the ruler, Han Fei is also not an idealist. He realizes that a state needs to be able to survive uh, even a mediocre emperor or king. Uh, and as such, uh, in some ways, this emphasis on the emperor vessel as the the crown sort of puts it in the executive and almost a figurehead like status although uh, very much executing or enforcing the laws uh, but at the same time reliant upon the cadre of she around him uh, who are these uh, wandering gentlemen these uh, administrator technocrats uh, who are pushing their own agendas uh, which is why we once again have that kind of issue of the contest between uh, the king and his own in a court. Uh, and because of that, it's, it's very difficult, but uh, Han Fei is trying to balance out this uh, idea of dealing with uh, potentially uh, wrong-headed or uh, stupid uh, central power, and then also the impersonal ambitions of the court that could potentially uh, throw the state awry, unhinged, and into the ditch of history. So how does one balance out these two factors? For Han Fei, his focus is on the law. He believes that the law needs to be enforced universally uh, and equally without recourse to sympathy, to mercy, uh, but also to claims of uh, filiality, uh, friendship, uh, and then circumstance. He, his idea is that... Uh, as long as these laws are being applied fairly across the entirety of a kingdom, uh, the people can expect and understand uh, what is going to happen to them uh, when they interact with the state in those administrative manners, whether that be paying taxes or being levied for warfare, and as such are, are less likely to rebel against what's happening to them and can be shaped towards achieving the benefit of the state more holistically. When it comes to these laws themselves, uh, Han Fei looks to what he sees as the two primary handles on the basket of state, reward and punishment. He sees these as being the hard and fast rules that will actually be able to influence the day-to-day -day activities of life, whether that be in the court or a distant village. Uh, if a ruler instead is to apply uh, or appeal to ideals of morality, uh, of duty, of sentiment, uh, these aren't necessarily going to have the results that are intended and can actually themselves be uh, utilized against uh, the ideas and the conceptions of the central state apparatus. It is because of this... Uh, this focus upon the pragmatic, the realist, the here and now, that Han Fei finds himself directly in conflict, particularly with the Confucian and with the Moist and Taoist uh, philosophies that existed at the same time, in contrast to his own school of legalistic thought. Uh, 
In particular, the legalists found themselves in direct confrontation with the Confucians. Uh, and Han Fei, in his writings, uh, is very critical of Confucian thought. Uh, it, it's almost like a renunciation of ritual, a renunciation of the ways of the past. He talks about at one point how in the distant past, uh, people were without shelter and were dying because they didn't have shelter. And so a person came along and taught them how to build simple huts, nests, uh, he calls them. And so this person was hailed the king of the people because he was the nest builder. In a later generation, people were dying because the food they were eating was foul, was off. And as such, uh, there came along a person that taught them how to make fire, and they called this person the fire maker, the king, because of his fire making skills. And then further down the line, people, uh, once again, weren't able to create enough food, and so a person came along and built them, uh, taught them how to build irrigation and paddies. And so this person was the great agriculturist and the king because of these skill sets. And he said, if someone came along in the, uh, the time of the agriculturalists and tried to teach people how to build nests or homes, uh, he would be laughed at. If someone came along uh, in, in that same period and tried to teach people how to build fires, they would be laughed at. And as such, uh, the, the ways of the ancients can't necessarily be projected forward and be utilized in the current day and age with its own unique circumstances. Uh, Han Fei actually uses a very interesting analogy when he talks about the Confucians. He says, the Confucians are like a farmer who one day is plowing his field and then he sees a rabbit uh, dash out and run towards a stump that's in the middle of the field. Uh, not seeing the stump, the rabbit uh, slams into it and breaks his neck. Suddenly, the farmer has a rabbit which he can cook and eat. And so, the farmer sits for the rest of his days in front of this stump with his hands outstretched, waiting for the rabbit to run into the stump and break its neck again. And the rest of the village laugh at him. For Han Fei, Confucians are the same. They look at the Zaoist traditions and forms and think that they can be reapplied in the modern world with its modern problems. Well, modern at that time. Uh, and And... And don't really understand the specificity and the uniqueness of the circumstance in which those Zaoist forms actually worked. It was unfortunate that it's Han Fei's focus on uh, sort of a rejection of these other forms of philosophy, which eventually leads to the infamous name of legalism throughout the rest of Chinese history, at least until uh, the Maoist period. Uh, when the Qin did come to power as the first dynasty in China, uh, they Im they enacted these uh, legalistic uh, reforms, and part of that uh, they they went through and they would uh, murder scholar officials uh, and political uh, philosophers and philosophers of all ilks uh, within the, the empire, as well as burning all their works in an attempt to suppress uh, Confucian uh, and other forms of thought, which they thought of as dangerous or threatening the newly unified regime. Uh, this was not successful in the long run, uh, obviously, because after only uh, one generation, the Qin themselves, uh, as the emperor, were overthrown, and eventually uh, the Han came to power, and they, they centralized their power base much more upon the Confucian teachings, although I'll talk about that at a different time. Uh, it's interesting that because of this rather anti-Confucian uh, bent within uh, legalistic uh, philosophy, that we actually end up not having nearly as much legalistic material uh, because it is reviled throughout most of the imperial period uh, by other scholars and philosophers. In conclusion, Han Fei and legalism was an extremely important philosophy, particularly in very early Chinese history, and then also as it makes a resurgence in the new Maoist period. It is often also seen as a springboard uh, because it is written upon, commentated, and criticized by other Chinese philosophers throughout Chinese history uh, up until the point when it is resurrected uh, for current and more modern reasons. Uh, despite this, we shouldn't only look at uh, legalism as a, a dead philosophy or a, a philosophy of tyrants, it needs to be understood and looked at uh, as that very realistic uh, trend of political philosophy. Very much uh, a, a 
open-eyed, uh, no sort of fluff, hard-nosed conception of political power and, and that relationship between power, the state, and the private individual. And because of this, it, is, it also provides a very interesting counterpoint uh, to those uh, more humanistic Confucian and Moist or Taoist principles of, uh, or once again, more naturalistic Taoist conceptions of how the world functions. Thank you for listening to this episode of Foolish Musings. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe or follow me on my blog at foolishmusings.com.